first and foremost, thank you so much for being here. Dr. Peter Adams, we really appreciate your time. Um, a quick intro into your work, and, and pardon me if I butcher this, you can feel free to correct me, but Dr. Peter Adams is the co-director and professor of aging cancer and immuno-oncology program over at Sanford Burnham Prebus. And uh, this, is the, this is the sentence that always gets me, so let's see if I can tackle it. Your lab investigates the impact of chromatin and epigenetics on cellular senescence, aging and yeah. cancer. And in particular, his lab hypothesizes that age-associated changes in chromatin and epigenetic programming contribute to the dramatic age-associated increase in incidence of cancer. So yeah. I know that you're going to clarify all of this for us. Right. I tried. So again, thank you for being with us. Um, Dr. Mm. Adams has been an incredible partner of Padre's Pedal of Cause for some time now. How many years have you been um, have you been working with Pedal of Cause? I've only written it twice i think because I, okay. I came to san diego in i think 2000 and end of 2016 and then i think the first couple of years i was doing other things i couldn't ride it so then i wrote it two years and then obviously i was looking forward to it last year but it was cancelled and i'll be i'll be doing the virtual one on, on may the 8th fantastic um, but you know i it's <laughs> it's, it's not a, i you know i love riding my bike so that's not a problem Yes, fantastic. Well, we're really excited that you're going to be a part. So let's dig in. I had the privilege privilege of watching um, your talk, your YouTube talk. You were in partnership with Fleet Science Center. And for those of you watching, I'll toss that link up as well. It was an incredible um, talk and gave me some insight into um, into healthy aging to prevent cancer is, is the discussion that you had. And I'll just dig into the questions. Uh, let's talk about what the causes of aging um, and why does cancer increase with age? I, you're the subject matter expert, so let's dig into it. Right, okay, yeah, so um, the, the, I mean, the, co the cause of cancer is, you know, like many other diseases of aging, heart disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, okay? I mean, really, all, all of these diseases result from from the accumulation of of damage um, with age. You know, various different types of of, of damage, uh, damage to, to DNA, damage to, to proteins, damage to you know other molecules within cells and, and tissues. Okay. Yes. Um, so that's and and it's it's really the the accumulation of that damage which causes the cells to divide uncontrollably and, and grow and and spread around the, the body. Okay. So so yes, yeah, the accumulation of of damage. Um, and you know, I think in simple terms, the reason why cancer increases with age is because you know we accumulate that damage as as we age. Okay. And in that respect, you know, cancer is very similar to many other of the common diseases of aging that I've already mentioned, Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes, et cetera, stroke. You know, all of these diseases, are, are, their incidence increases with age because the, the, the damage accumulates with age. Um, I think, you know, the specific challenge for each disease is to, is to try and figure out, you know, what are the specific types of of damage that are that are accumulating with age, which are most important for that disease, and you know, and and specifically, how does the damage promote the disease? Because when we understand the specific molecular mechanisms, that's that's when we can come in with drugs to try and prevent it. Understood. <clears throat> okay. And then I know you mentioned something in that talk that I found to be really interesting, and that was the epigenetic clock. Um, you talked about research that you and your team are currently doing, and I love how you, proudly you talk about your team. That got me too. Um, and you mentioned the epigenetic clock and its correlation to the increased risk of cancer and disease with age. What is the epigenetic clock? Can you break that down for us? Right. So, so first, first of all, you know, we need to understand what is, you know, what do we mean by epigenetics, or, or in other words, what is the epigenome? Okay, so, so the genome uh, refers to the, the DNA within, within each of our cells, okay? There's about, you know, six, six billion letters in the, in the DNA sequence in, in each of our cells, okay? So it's a phenomenal amount of, of DNA and a phen phenomenal amount of information in there. That's, that's what we call the genome. Um, that, but on top of that genome, there's, there's other levels of information, okay? So there's a, the, the DNA is folded in specific ways. It's wrapped around specific proteins and other molecules. It's, mo it's chemically modified in, in specific ways. And so all of those, those modifications to the DNA 
that's what we refer to as the as the epigenome okay so in other words it's it's above the genome okay or, or outside of epi um so that's that's the epigenome um <clears throat> and you know a, a simple way of understanding why that's important is if you, you, know, you think of a heart cell and a, and a liver cell or a brain cell, okay, all of those cells within, within, it, within an individual's body, okay, my, my heart cells and my liver cells, they have a, pretty much exactly the same DNA sequence, okay, and yet obviously they are very, you know, they have very different, they look very different, they have very different functions, okay, and the reason for that is because, because of the epigenome. Okay, so the modifications to the DNA, which changes the function of the DNA and controls which genes are on and which genes are off in specific cells and specific tissues. Okay, so, so that's the epigenome. Um, a really interesting thing about the epigenome, though, is that, is that it changes with age. Okay, so it's not fixed or, or static. It actually progressively changes with age. Okay, it's sometimes referred to as uh, epigenetic drift. Um, but it changes with age in, in such a way that is, um, you know, in, at least in, su some, in some, some respects is very similar between individuals, okay? So it changes in the same way in different people, and it changes at the same rate um, through their lifespan, okay? So, so therefore, that means that we can take a snapshot of this epigenome at, a moment, at any moment in a person's life and basically tell how that old that person is. Okay, and so that's, that's what we call the epigenetic clock. Um, but it gets even more interesting, okay, because it turns out that it's not, simply, it's not simply measuring what we call chronological age, okay? Chronological age is just what, you know, basically your age as measured by your driver's license, okay? It's the, it's the number of years since you were born and, and nothing can change that, okay? But we, in aging, we, talk, we also talk about biological aging okay and so although everybody ages at the same chronological rate okay that's just time different people age at different biological rates okay so you know some 50 year olds are very healthy some 50 year olds are very unhealthy okay so biologically speaking they are aging at different rates and so it's becoming apparent that within this within this epigenetic clock there is also information on biological age Okay, so potentially we can look at a person's epigenetic clock and see, is this person aging healthily or, or unhealthily? And uh, the ultimate goal would be to look at this person's epigenetic clock and actually figure out, well, you know, 20 years from now, is this person going to get Alzheimer's, heart disease or, or cancer? Okay, I mean, that, that would be, I mean, that's a, that's a very ambitious goal, okay, but that's kind of why people are, are excited by it. Yeah, and it's super interesting. And if you do get a chance to dig into his talk, I love uh, Dr. Adams how you break out some great visuals um, that further define this. So if you get a chance to dig into that, do so, because it's really interesting. And I sat there and pretty much geeked out for a solid hour and a half yesterday watching it and digging into it a little bit more detail. But what steps can we take to potentially slow down the damage to the cells that you talked about? Or what else can we do to delay the onset of cancer and these diseases that we've discussed? Yeah, so I mean, I think there's, there's, you know, there's, there's two things which, you know, come to mind initially, okay, I mean, the, the first one is, um, you know, some, some variation on, um, you know, what we call in the lab calorie restriction, okay, or dietary restriction, okay, and so this basically means limiting the amount of calories or, or energy which are, which are consumed, but still maintaining, obviously, a nutritionally balanced diet. OK, um, and so it's been, you know, it's been well documented in, in studies in, you know, very fly starting off in yeast, flies, worms and mice. And there's, there's also evidence from from, um, you know, from primates, some monkey models that this this calorie restriction does promote healthy aging and, and longevity. OK, so it will make species live longer and it will make them live live healthier. OK, um, there's. There's, there's very good evidence for that. But the trouble is, okay, that the type of calorie restriction we're talking about is about 30 to 40% calorie restriction. Okay, that's so, pretty extreme, yeah, right? So, that's, right, so yeah. you, you're talking about, you know, someone who's not, not we don't about someone who's not eating excessively, okay, just someone who's eating 
you know, a kind of normal, healthy diet, so take, they then have to me. cut back another 30 or 40 percent. So it's pretty right. It's pretty drastic. And you know, the general consensus is that there's no way that humans can do it long term. And it's not something that we should be trying to encourage people to do. Um, right. There are people who've tried it and they say, uh, you know, they come out of it the other end and say, well, you know, it may, it may make you live longer, but it may also makes you bloody miserable and things <laughs> like that. Because um, so, there are there are a small number of people around the world who who are, you know, trying this. And there's, there's websites dedicated to it and stuff. You can find it and you'll find pictures of these people. It's not particularly attractive either. So I could do, but I could do something on a smaller scale where if I were to fast two or three days a month or right, I could do right. a mod, my own model of intermittent fasting and that would yeah, be interesting. Yeah, so okay. now there's a lot of variations on this. Um, you know, one of the simplest is just to have a long overnight fast. You know, for example, a 12, 14, maybe even 16 hour overnight fast. Um, so, you know, you, you eat your dinner relatively early and you have a relatively late breakfast and that's a long overnight fast. There's evidence that that can be beneficial. Then there's things like the five plus two diet where you eat pretty much what you want for five days a week and two days a week you fast. And then there's something else called the fasting mimicking diet where you, you basically fast for, you know, one day a month or, or every couple of months or whatever. And it's thought that basically the way all of these interventions work is probably somewhat similar. I mean, it's still debated. There's a lot of work still going on in it. But I think in, in general terms, I think what probably happens is that by limiting the, the calorie consumption, the en energy intake, it basically forces the body into kind of tissue, into, into maintenance mode, okay? okay? It has to, you know, it realizes that, you know, it doesn't have unlimited resources, um, so, so it, it has to preserve what it's got, and that means it, it, you know, preserves tissues, maintains tissues, and that ultimately leads to a, you know, a more more healthy aging and and probably also a longer life. Well, and um, as you know, I'm in fitness, so I'm I'm going to be preaching this to the masses, <laughs> right. to my clients. And then, what about movement? Movement plays. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's so that's the other big one. The other, you know, the other one is 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 exercise. Okay, so. It's it's all in, there's I mean it's very clear in in humans that that you know exercise particularly promotes healthy aging okay not not necessarily quite so much longevity I think there the evidence is not quite so good but but exercise promotes healthy aging okay I mean I think we we pretty much all take that for granted we can see that but you know it's it's true um, but. To me, what, what's really inter in, really interesting about you know the, the studies going on in, in exercise is the 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 kind of the, the scope of it. Okay, I mean you know I used to think that exercise well you know makes your muscles stronger, makes your lungs better, your heart better, etc. And that that's kind of the, the end of it, yeah. But actually, it's it's much more than that. It's it's really you know very systemic. Okay, so I think there's accumulating evidence that exercise will also you know promote uh, cognitive function through aging and prevent diseases such as as Alzheimer's. Okay, so I think the, the benefits of exercise are really systemic throughout throughout the whole body, which I think is really important. You know, to to to, to understand and for people to take on take on board. And and you know, from my perspective as a, as a biologist, it's really fascinating as to why that is as well. Okay, what are the the mechanisms by which you know, flexing our muscles or, or, you know, getting our heart rate up, okay, you know, what, why does that make our brain age more healthily, okay, I think that's really, really interesting, and there's, 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 it's really not well understood. Um, well, and I, the cool thing that you said yesterday when we talked too, as we were prepping for this interview, is you said we're we're on the cusp of so many discoveries when it comes to movement. There's so much still to learn. And that's what blew me away is I don't think I knew that. And I should know that because I am in this industry. And that gets me so excited because it tells me that there's so much potential for what exercise can do for the human body. And that's yeah. So and I cool. would, you know, I'd say you might want to edit this out, but you know, I'd say, I'd say you're in the right business. Okay. Because <laughs> I, 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 I do think that I personally feel we're on the cusp of a, we could be on the cusp of a social revolution uh, along the lines that, of the one that, you know, led to, you know, basically massive decreases in smoking. Okay. I mean, basically that came about through, 
you know, obviously, you know, medical and scientific knowledge, which was then translated into, uh, you know, government policies and, and social, you know, ultimately social pressure, yeah, to for, for people to stop smoking and, and anti-smoking campaigns. And I think right. that as it becomes apparent how systemic the, the benefits of, of exercise are, okay, and as I say, we, which we're, we're really just scratching the surface at this point in terms of our understanding, I think as, as that becomes better understood, I think, you know, we, we're going to have a similar type of, 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 you know, revolution in terms of, you know, actually really encouraging people to, you know, to, to, to exercise more. Um, well, I mean, that's, a, that's my heart right there. That's, I, I, I hope you're right. Cause I'm clinging on to yeah, that. Yeah. Right. So, so that's why it's so, which obviously, you know, for people who are in, you know, in that, that business, obviously, you know, that's going to have a lot of, you know, direct and indirect, um, you know, benefits and business and all the rest of it. Which takes the beauty and it takes the beauty of Padres Pedal the Cause and what we do, combining movement with a mission of accelerating cures and makes it such a beautiful thing. And that, yeah. that brings me to a close. And I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Adams, for spending time with us today. Um, I'm going to encourage everyone to go to that YouTube talk and take a look at it if you want to dig deeper into this. And I will see you virtually yeah, on May yeah, 8th. Joining yeah. us as we're built for cures. Anything else you want to end with? Dr. Yeah, Adams? I just wanted to say because often when I give these kinds of talk I'm always asked about um some of the supplements okay because there is there's a lot of there are a lot of people out there taking things and there's a lot there's a lot of interest in the kind of supplements that people can take okay so I know people are taking things like metformin alpha ketoglutarate NMN NR resveratrol okay some of these supplements which are um you know meant to promote healthy aging and, and longevity. And I'd say that's, a, you know, in addition to, you know, diet and, and exercise, that's probably the, the third thing that, that people kind of have access to at the moment. Um, but what I would say about that is, and, you know, and there is, a, there is a lot of evidence for these things. You know, a lot of it comes from mouse, you know, studies in mice. There is data in humans for, for many of these things. Um, but what I would also say is that, you know, there isn't good, I wouldn't say there isn't good, um, you know, clinical trial data in, in humans that, that really says that, you know, any of these things at the moment should be taken by, you know, by, no, you know, normal, healthy, aging adults as kind of a preventative measure. Okay, I mean, there are studies now ongoing about to start for, for metformin. Okay, that's probably the first thing that's going to be tested for its ability just to promote healthy aging and, you know, normal, healthy, elderly humans. Um, but even there, so that the data is not there at the moment. And number two is that there is actually some data coming out suggesting that, you know, metformin can have, you know, for example, detrimental effects when combined with exercise. Okay, so oh, wow. on the one hand, although exercise is beneficial and metformin is it appears to be beneficial in, in many people um you put the two of them together and at least in some people they they kind of cancel each other out and they're actually detrimental okay so, wow. so what i the, what i would say is that although you know that these supplements are there they're accessible people are taking them i'd also you know say you know i think people should be a little bit in my opinion should be a little bit cautious and certainly i i would talk to a talk to a doctor or a, you know a, a dietary or nutritional expert and get their perspective before you start taking all this stuff for yourself well thank you again for your time today and i appreciate it and i hope you have a lovely holiday next week mm -hmm.